Many years ago, my wife and I moved to the Boston area in a little town called Lexington. And right down the street, the very first week that we rolled into town, there was this little church building. And after we were there for a week, it was the month of June, someone put up a sign, closed for the summer. And every summer, they put up the same sign. And for a lot of churches, well, well, summer's the time you take off. And even in some discipling churches, it can be kind of a summer slump. But if you choose, it can be a summer surge. Amen, guys? So the title of a lesson is simply Summer Slump or Summer Surge. You know, our congregation is organized into small groups called Bible Talks. On the back of your bulletin, you'll find a listing of all the Bible Talks that we have in the congregation. And... Uh, the reason for the grouping of people and each member being involved in the Bible talk is that we're loosely modeling it on Jesus and the apostles. Now, we realize the Bible talk leaders are, are somewhat uh, lesser than Jesus, amen? <laughs> and a lot of times the workers in the Bible talks are a little bit lesser than the apostles, amen? But that's the model that we have, is Jesus and the apostles. And so today, we're going to be doing a very practical lesson out of the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 6. You know, for a lot of us, we think that Jesus' ministry was always surging, always cranking. But there was a time that it was tanking. Let's read about it. Mark chapter 6. Beginning verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? And what's this wisdom that's been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph, Judas and Simon? And are her sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown among his relatives and his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of of faith. Wednesday night in the West region, we studied Luke chapter 7 about the centurion who amazed Jesus with his faith. And that's pretty amazing to think that Jesus is God and he amazed God with his faith. But right here, the Bible says the people in Jesus' hometown amazed Jesus, amazed God with their lack of faith. Now, that's a lot of lack of faith right there. And because there was no faith, there were no miracles. And we need to understand, that's a principle of Scripture. Where there is no faith, there are no miracles. And so we can be sure of this. Where there are no miracles, there is no faith. Turn me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll be back in Mark 6 in a moment. You know, most of us hold the conviction, rightly so, that every baptism is a miracle. But right here in 1 Corinthians 6, we're reminded all the more so, beginning in verse 9. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And the church said, Amen. You know, this was said of the first century church. But it could likewise be said of us, the 21st century church. You know, that summer of 79, when I saw that sign that said, closed for the summer on the church, one of the things that, that took me aback were the miracles that took place. And one particular young lady started coming to one of our Bible talks in downtown Boston. She loved it when she came. And later on, she got open about her life. 
And she worked down in what was called the combat zone, or the red light district. And she was a prostitute. She came. She studied the Bible. And then she was baptized and radically changed. She became a Bible talk leader. Then became a ministry leader. And then married a Christian brother who was a Harvard graduate, and they went into the ministry. Now, how's that for a story? See, we should have the conviction, if we're people of faith, that anyone can change. When you have the conviction that anyone can change, where there is faith, there is miracles. Are you with me here, church? But you can be sure where there are miracles. There is no faith. Let's get back to Mark 6. What does Jesus do when there is no faith? There is no miracles. Remember, he's the example of a Bible talk leader. So if your Bible talk is tanking and you're a Bible talk leader, you need to pay attention to this next part right here. Amen, guys? Middle of verse 6. After he was amazed at their lack of faith... He didn't quit being the Bible talk leader, okay? (laughs) Sometimes our Bible talks can amaze us that way. I don't know. It says, then, after he's amazed by the lack of faith, then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Jesus started to get out there by himself and preaching the word. Now look what happens. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. Wow. He called the guys. This is now. Do what I've been doing. Each one of you apostles, you need to get out there and preach the word. Amen? These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. The miracles began to return. Where there is faith, there are miracles. Are you with me here, church? Well, as soon as the miracles return, sure enough, Satan struck. In the next several verses, we have the account of Herod killing John the Baptist. And isn't it just like Satan? When, just when you get your ministry moving, just when the disciples are out there preaching the word, Satan's going to strike with evil, isn't he? Yeah. Well, in the midst of that, though, what was going on? Verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Well, certainly we see accountability right here, amen? But we can easily infer then that even in the midst of the hard times, even in the midst of Satan's attack, the apostles were still out there sharing their faith and preaching the word. Because even in the midst of hard times, you still believe that anyone can change. You know, I was so encouraged by a story I heard this week about Amy Cheramella. Now, of course, we know the Cheramellas just moved down from Eugene, and they, they built a great church up there. But due to some circumstances, they stepped out of the ministry and moved on down here to join us and rebuild their faith. But when they came on down, Jeremy came, of course, without a job and with very little money. And that sometimes worries wives a little bit. But something I appreciate about Amy is even in the midst of these heavy challenges, she still was out there sharing her faith. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, she was out there sharing her faith with this one woman. They got to talking, and she invited her to church to come on out. And, and then the, the, the woman happened to uh, hear about that Amy had just come on down, and she shared with them, and then her, her husband was looking for a job. She said, well, you know, my husband is looking for an IT guy. Maybe that could work out. Well, sure enough, Jeremy and her husband hooked up over the phone, and just this past Thursday, Jeremy got offered the job. Amen, guys? You see, where there's faith, there are miracles. Now, the woman hasn't come out to church yet, but amen, Jeremy's got a job. (laughs) One thing at a time. Thank you, Luis. Let's get back to the text. 
Verse 31. Then, because so many people were coming and going, they didn't even have a chance to eat. Does that sound like your Bible talk? <laughs> he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. How do you view people at work, in your neighborhood, at school? Like sheep without a shepherd? That's how Jesus viewed everyone that was not a disciple. Verse 35. By this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Well, how many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and, go and see. When they found out, they said, well, five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus directed them all to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds of fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. And the number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Now we know from Matthew's account that it was 5,000 men along with the women and the children. But Mark notes right here, that when the 5,000 men ate, they were satisfied. And if you can satisfy 5,000 men with food, that's a flat miracle right there. <laughs> you don't have to mention the women and the children. It's a miracle. It is a miracle. I notice right here a couple of things that many times people feel are not necessary in churches. Number one is organization. A lot of people think, oh, Jesus just kind of went by the Spirit. <laughs> he was a very organized man. Matter of fact, that's why he had the 12 apostles. He was very organized. And even for this miracle, the Bible says right here that he had the apostles have everybody grouped in 50s and 100s. Well, some say it would have made it easy to count and figure out that there were 5,000 people there. And others say, no, really. This way, they could more easily distribute the fish and the bread. It takes organization to meet everybody's needs. Secondly, we notice the use of numbers. Sometimes people say, well, I don't, I don't want to talk about numbers. Well, the scriptures do talk about numbers. Matter of fact, there's a whole book on numbers, amen, guys? <laughs> but right here, the numbers are very important because they help us understand the magnitude of the miracle. If the Holy Spirit would have just simply written, well, they had some bread and some fish and they fed some people. Go, ah, that's really great. That's, that's really inspiring. No, you wouldn't be inspired by that at all. <laughs> if you said, hey, we only had five loaves and two fish and we satisfied 5,000, let me run it by you again, 5,000 men, you go, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. But you need the numbers to understand those things. I have three charges from this passage that I feel we need to consider. Remember, Jesus and the apostles is our modeling for our Bible talks. And so our first point is for all the Bible talk leaders, you must be an exemplary example. Now, before we go further, we need to understand this, is that all of us have been called to be like Jesus. And if we're following Jesus, one day we too are going to be a leader. Amen? So some of you are Bible talk leaders now, but the goal and the vision is that every single disciple becomes a Bible talk leader. 
Now some, because they're, they may have a little bit more talent or a little bit more public speaking skills, they might become a Bible talk leader six months after they're baptized. For others, it might take six years just to get the kind of training to be able to do it. But nonetheless, if you're baptizing other people, you baptize four or five people, boom, you've got yourself a Bible talk and you're the leader. Amen, guys? Well, what kind of a leader was Jesus? Well, turn to Mark chapter 10. Verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished. Well, those who followed were afraid. Wow. Jesus astonished the people that were closest to him. Very often, we're the least astonishing to the people closest to us. But Jesus' leadership, in this particular case, guts and courage in going to Jerusalem, because they knew that Jesus could very well be killed right there, they were just astonished at this man leading the way up to Jerusalem. As Bible talk leaders here in the congregation, we believe that anyone that leads a Bible talk should earn the right by their life and by their doctrine. They need to be leading the way in their relationship with God. They need to be leading the way in their evangelism. They need to be leading the way in all areas of their life. Now, very often, when you become a leader... There's a sense of, oh, I, I want to I make sure I stay a leader. And so what sometimes happens is we lose our sense of transparency. We lose our sense of openness. And that, in the end, will destroy us. You know, we had a very tough thing happen in, in one of our churches. A, a, a young man named DJ, who's the preacher for our church in New York City, called me up a couple Saturdays ago, and he says, bro, I've got, some really, I, I've got to confess some really bad sin. I've gotten into some pornography. I said, bro, you need to come out here right now with Casey, and we need to talk, get the board of areas to help you guys. This is very serious. And so they came on out, and they spent four days. And some of the scriptures that we shared with DJ and Casey were these. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Jesus is talking to the church at Ephesus. And he says in verse 3, You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown worried. Well, that sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? But look at verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. You know, a lot of times we misquote this passage. And we say that, the church in Ephesus lost their first love. Well, you know, you know sometimes we you know how we lose our wallet or we lose our glasses. It seems to be incidental, by accident. But that's not the scripture right here. The scripture says you have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. We talked to DJ straight up. I said, bro, what were you like? Like, as a, as a young disciple, bro, I, that was one of my, the areas I was so happy that I'd repented, and it was my purity. I was strong, and I was vibrant. I said, now look what's happened. Remember the height from which you've fallen, and you need to understand. You need to understand. You have lost, no, forsaken your first love. I said, let's go over to 2 Corinthians. I appreciate the board of areas as one of our shepherding couples. They're very, very busy people, and yet they took out so much of their time over those four days to get in there with DJ and Casey, to study the Bible with them, to get them have deep convictions about the Word of God and about purity and about having an awesome marriage that's going to protect both of them from the world. And one of the passages that we studied out was this passage right here about repentance. Because we said some very strong things to DJ. Paul says this in verse 8. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurts you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. 
For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you prove yourselves to be innocent in this matter. You know, some of the things that, that we said to DJ, I mean, he cried several times. It was hard. It was hard for Casey to see what he was going through, but sin is like that. Sin just deceives us. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. And no one is above sin. I mean, the greatest figure of the Old Testament was David. And David, the great king, was called a man after God's own heart. Not because he didn't sin. As a matter of fact, David got into adultery and even murder. Why was he called a man after God's own heart? Because of his repentance. That's what makes a man or a woman after God's own heart. And it's not just a matter of feeling sorry, the, the Bible says right here. You can cry all you want. Worldly sorrow, you're going to feel bad about what you do and all the embarrassment of it. But God intends a godly sorrow that's going to produce an indignation. Instead of loving that sin, you're going to hate that sin. And you're going to yank it and root it out of your life. You know, we sent DJ and Casey back. And uh, that Sunday afternoon, they pulled the church together after uh, the service. And uh, DJ confessed to the whole church. And that was, that was the right thing to do. And I'm happy to report, and one of the older brothers oversaw saw it. That was George. George Grima. And uh, he said, bro, you'd have been so proud of the church. He says, yeah, DJ and Casey both shared, and, and Casey talked about how she'd forgiven her husband, and, and she now trusted him again because she could sense the repentance. You know, you can just sense it. So, so the church was crying, and then they just hugged and loved up on DJ and Casey. Bro, it was like something right out of the Bible. <laughs> you know, church... We need to understand that we can get into that sin and a whole bunch of other sins if we are not transparent with our lives. And yes, we desire each one of our leaders to be an exemplar example. But not just in your quiet times, not just in your evangelism, not just in your doctrine, but in your transparency, in your openness, and even the confession of sin. Amen? Amen? Our second point is Jesus had an extraordinary group. Turn to Acts chapter 4. In Acts 4, we find that Peter and John have been arrested. And they're called before the Sanhedrin. And Peter just preaches the word in front of these guys. I mean, these, this is the Jewish intelligentsia. This is the Jewish leadership. And Peter just lays out the last part of what he says is verse 12. It says, salvation's found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Basically, he was saying to them, all you guys are lost. <laughs> now, what was their reaction? Verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Wow. Jesus, at one time, astonished the disciples. Now, the disciples were astonishing the Jewish intelligentsia. Wow. By what? their boldness, their courage. And when the Jewish leadership saw us, man, you guys remind me of no one else but Jesus. Wow, that's incredible. They were just like Jesus. And the Bible notes that they were simply unschooled and from a human point of view, ordinary men. 
But we understand where there's faith, there's miracles. And anyone can change. And so these ordinary guys became extraordinary in the Lord. Does that fire you on up right there? Friday night, we had an incredible college devotional. And uh, Raul and Linda have done a wonderful job in, in, in leading overall the uh, campus group here in the congregation. And Raul had come up with, with, with really a, uh, a devotional I'd, I'd never heard before. It was a sharing devotional. And it centered on the concept of imitation. And he used this scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's go over there. Paul, Silas, and Timothy write 1 Thessalonians, and verse 4 is them speaking to the church in Thessalonica. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he's chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Right here, Paul says, you received the message with deep conviction. But what was really awesome is you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Now, some people try to be super spiritual and say, oh, I'm just imitating Jesus. But well, why do you think God sent Jesus down to earth? Because we needed to see flesh and blood what God was really like. And we still need to see flesh and blood what God is really like. And that's in the life of a strong disciple. And so we imitate God. We imitate Jesus by imitating the godly qualities in our brothers and sisters. And oftentimes, a super spiritual person is just a prideful person that doesn't want to imitate. Particularly in this day of, of independence and individualism, even though everybody wears the same style clothes. You know, imitation's powerful. The world's got it figured out. Doctors... Go to medical school, sure, for three years. But they don't do anything to anybody until they walk around with another doctor and watch in a practical sense how he takes care of that person. Mechanics are the same way. They don't just toss in a young man that wants to learn how to be a mechanic and say, here's, here's the motor, dude. <laughs> the same thing is true with carpenters. I mean, Jesus himself learned it from his dad. Even New Wages, just in our, our, uh, one of our favorite little restaurants down below our building right there, they had a new girl that was learning how to be a waitress. What was she doing? She was shadowing the one that was doing it. Even waitresses understand imitation and discipling. Don't you think as a church we need to get that one on down, church? You know, it was so powerful, though, during the devotional. Because... So many people had an opportunity to share. And I think what happened was a very powerful thing. is that the entire campus group began to see that everybody had something special about them. And it was powerful hearing some of the stronger brothers and sisters sharing about great qualities, even in so-called weaker brothers and sisters. And there's a powerful bonding there when you submit to one another by imitation. And you're looking for the good in each other. You know, the world disciples us to look for the bad. Jesus says, look for the good. Now, no leader is perfect. And we shouldn't put our leaders on a pedestal. That's sin. On the other hand, we're called to respect our leaders. And we're called to imitate their faith and to imitate their lives. It's a cool thing that happened this this week to me. I had to pull aside two brothers who were not getting along with each other. And so I said, okay, guys, you need to come over to the house. And uh, one was disrespectful, and the other one was mean. <laughs> and, uh, of course, as the mean one got meaner, the other guy got more and more disrespectful. And as that guy got more and more disrespectful, the other guy got meaner and meaner. 
So we all got scriptures out, we got them together, dealt with it. And at, at the end, I, I, I turned to the one that was mean, and I'd shared a scripture on kindness. I says, well, what do you think? He says, you know something? Now I understand by watching you that you can be kind and still be very firm and lay out the truth. One of the things that we need to learn to do in our discipling with each other is to have mercy and kindness and gentleness. I think that's particularly important for the brothers. You know, I think in this age of machoism, I think it's because people are so insecure about their masculinity. We think that being a man is being hard, harsh. But the Bible talks about those who are spiritual need to gently instruct one another and to be kind in our instruction of each other. And you know something? You'll win people's hearts. You know, it's very powerful. The last day that uh, DJ and, and Casey were there, they, they sent a card to Elena and myself. And Nick gave it to me a week later, but that, that's okay. I'm sure he was busy. <laughs> and DJ and, and Casey wrote, I want to read just part of it here. This is from DJ. Kip and Elena, I'm at a loss to express the feelings I feel for the two of you. You've done so much for me, and I've done so little in return. You have believed in me when no one else would have be believed and loved me perhaps when no one else even could. You've broken through the Philistine lines and gotten me water, even though I'm not your leader or king. You have treated me royally, even though I wasn't worthy to sit at your gates. I love you so much, and I've never been served or loved more. A rebuke from you two is a badge of honor, and to serve you till death is the highest honor in God's kingdom. You have brought me back to the Lord when I had forsaken him. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you a million times, thank you. I'm with you, heart and soul. Casey wrote, Thank you so much for all you've done for us this week and for the last four years. I'm so grateful for your love for DJ and me. You truly are our parents in the faith. No one has ever loved, persevered, and guided us in the way that you have. Thank you for using God's word to inspire, encourage, and disciple us. I will hold your words close to my heart. If we're going to impact people, we're going to have to have the guts to say the difficult things with an open Bible. You'll never change another person's life until you're ready to put the relationship on the line. It was a very difficult week for me and Elena. I mean, we've discipled DJ and Casey a long time. And it could take him out of the ministry. It could take him out of the kingdom. And yet... We said it in tears and with love because we know that when a person obeys the scriptures, they can change. I really believe in the congregation. We have got to get back to very loving, kind, and gentle discipling. But I think in many relationships, we're not asking the tough questions. And we've got to get our Bibles open during our D times. And we've got to be able to ask each other the tough questions. And this leads me to my last point. Exceptional effectiveness. Exceptional effectiveness. Yeah? Jesus was an exemplary example. Yes? The disciples became an extraordinary group. But bottom line, that produced exceptional effectiveness. We saw in that passage where there was no faith and no miracles... And then, by the end of the chapter, 5,000 men had eaten and were satisfied. Well, how's that translated in the New Testament? Well, turn to Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, Peter's preaching before thousands of people in Jerusalem. And he just lays it out. He concludes in verse 36. Therefore, let all those really be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
I mean, Peter said all those thousands of people had crucified Jesus. Why? Because everybody has sinned. Amen? That same sermon could be preached today. Everybody's crucified Jesus because we've all sinned. Amen? Well, what happened when they heard this? Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, Well, brothers, what should we do? We, we believe in Jesus. We know our sins have crucified. What do we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Is that awesome right there? You see, when people believed that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, when people believed that Jesus had died for their sins, then they repented of their sins, and they were water baptized to receive the forgiveness of sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says just that day, 3,000 people were baptized. Look what happens to the church, verse 47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Every day, people were being baptized. Is that awesome? And it wasn't just Jerusalem church. Turn to Acts 16. Verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. That should be the goal for every church of God. Are you with me right here, guys? And one day, we're going to do that. Amen? Amen. There's no doubt they had exceptional effectiveness. Well, number one, they had faith. Where there's faith, there's miracles. Number two, there was righteousness. The Bible, David himself says, Lord, you have dealt with me according to my righteousness. Lord, you have rewarded me according to my righteousness. Psalm 18, verse 20 and verse 24. That's a, that's, that's a principle in Scripture. And one of the things that I think is very important in discipling is accountability. Remember we saw that in Mark chapter 6, verse 30, when the disciples came back and reported everything that they had done and everything they had taught. Accountability is very, very necessary. We understand that again from a worldly point of view. How many of us have wanted to lose weight? No, I, I, you don't have to raise your hand. I, I'm just, I'm just, it's, a, it's a rhetorical question. It was a rhetorical question. I'd have to raise my hand. <laughs> well, you know... If you try to do it on your own, you usually don't do it. That's why a lot of these weight-losing groups come together. You come together, and you talk about your love for food, because that's, that's how you put weight on, okay? And yeah, there are a few people that have hormonal problems, but that's a few people. And then... In a lot of these little groups, they say, okay, get on the scale. Oh, baby, it's the moment of accountability right there. <laughs> There's nothing like getting on the scale. It's a moment. And you know something? Those groups are very successful. It takes a lot of guts to join one of those groups, doesn't it? But those are usually the people who say, you know something? I need to just lose some weight. Instead of just looking in the mirror and saying that every Monday morning, They do something. There's accountability there. Amen? From a school point of view, think about it. If a school never had quizzes or tests or finals, would you be... Sweet. Yeah, that's, that's uh, exactly... Yeah. Then, then, wouldn't learn anything. I still remember uh, my senior year, I was taking Greek, and uh, the first quarter, we had, we had quizzes every Friday. Second quarter, quizzes every Friday. And, I mean, it was, it was challenging. And, of course, everybody was complaining to the teacher. Well, by third quarter, the class that started off with about 30 was down to 10. But we were all pretty serious about learning Greek. And so the teacher says, you know something? You guys are so serious. We're not going to have any more quizzes on Friday. Everybody's like, oh, man, no more quizzes. Well, then people started getting lax. And, and I'd have to admit that yours truly was one of them. But I didn't stop going to class. One day, only four of us showed up at class. He got ticked. It was about six or seven weeks into the quarter, ten, quarters, uh, ten weeks long. 
And he says, that does it. He says, I'm not going to nurse you guys long. long. I'm going to make you learn the whole book. You can show up or not show up. You can on the whole book. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I was, I was panicking. A lot of the other bro- uh, people were panicking. Anyway, thank God on the final, half of the final was uh, translating John chapter 15 from, from the Greek into English. I was going, thank you, God. Amen. It's good to be a Christian. Uh, <laughs> The truth be known is the the fact that there wasn't the weekly accountability in the end killed some of those people. Some of those people flunked the final because there was no accountability week to week. Now, we all have kind of a final exam in store. It's called Judgment Day. And it's going to be a humdinger. You're either going to go one or two places. You're going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. Let's face it. Accountability is necessary within Christianity if we're going to help, help each one of us pass that final exam of judgment. Are you with me right here? So instead of having a bad attitude towards accountability, let's see the good in accountability. Amen? Now, yes, we need to be motivated out of our love for God and His grace. But even that, sometimes we fall short in the areas that we need to be held accountable. You know, uh, there's no question that some of us need to be held accountable in our quiet times. Having a great time with God every morning. I hope that after the service, if that's you, you turn to the person that's the side and say, Listen, I need you to be asking me if I'm doing this. Some of us need to be held accountable in our evangelism. You haven't brought a visitor to a Bible talk or church for a long time. That's not to say we all have a Sunday or a Bible talk. We don't have a visitor there. But generally speaking, we need to have visitors on out. Are you with me right here, guys? And we need accountability there. There are a couple of other areas of accountability that I think that we've fallen short in. One, one is that, and I think it takes away from the joy in our fellowship, is having the brothers and sisters go on dates. And, and I've gotten feedback that a lot of our brothers and sisters have not been going on dates for, for a host of different reasons. And, and this goes also for the marriage too here, guys. And I'm sure the sisters are going amen on that. <laughs> you know, in, in the world, dating is, is full of games, impurity, and deceit. That, that's dating in the world. You know, was, uh, there's an event that happened, I'll tell about it in a second, that I always think about this time of year. But I was thinking about my senior year of high school. And I had a unique thing happen to me. My father was in the Navy, and so we moved back to Chicago for my 12th grade year after having lived there for 6th and 7th grade. And so I knew everybody at the high school, except, you know, there's a four-year expanse. So my best friend named Randy Hill, he grew to be 6'10". It was incredible. Wow, you grew. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of funny because uh, most of the guys on the football team had, had different nicknames and stuff. And I wore white shoes back in those days. Uh, so my, my, my one nickname was Joe, like Joe Namath. And then the other, the other one was, was Flash. There was a day I could run. And, um, I, I, and, and, you know, I, I remember coming on in, and I, I just asked the head shooter to go to homecoming, Sally Gilliland. I mean, she incredible. <laughs> I come on in, and they go, Flash, that's awesome. Joe, way to go. Okay, I mean, guys, that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that Sunday, she calls. She goes, Kip, uh, I've got some good news and sort of bad news. And what is that? Well, you know your good friend, Jerry Smith? We got back together this weekend. And now I'm still willing to go next weekend with you to homecoming. But we were wondering if it'd be okay if I, I went with Jerry and, and then um, we could find you a date. I, uh, Sally, just forget it. Just forget it. That's fine. You and Jerry, go. Don't worry about me. No, no, no. We got to get you a date. No, no, no. No, no. I, I feel... I've got to get you a date. No. She says, no, I've got to get you a date. So Monday at school in the cafeteria, they paraded by me all the girls that didn't have a date for homecoming. I ended 
up going with Betty Zetterberg, my calculus teacher's daughter. Oh. And that's, that's high school. That's the kind of games people play. I went out there that night, and, and one night, you know, we're making out after. It's, it's just terrible. That, that's the world. That's what you do. That's what, that's, that's what happens. That's dating in the world. Well, what reminded me of that was my, at the end of my senior year, I was supposed to have had a girlfriend down in Florida where I just moved from. And we'd write each other every week, tell each other what was going on. Well, I didn't tell her about my dates. And I, and I, I was so excited to go back to see her. I had to go back for a couple days to Florida. And I decided to surprise her. And... The reason I remember it, it was on All-Star Night, Tuesday night. And every All-Star Baseball game on Tuesday night, I always remember going to see Suzanne. I went there, knocked on the door. She opens the door, and then there's this big guy standing right behind her. She goes, Kip. I go, Suzanne. She goes, I want you to meet my really new boyfriend right here. Okay. So, let's show you how it was. So then I go in. It was the most uncomfortable 10 minutes of my life. I pretend to be watching the baseball game there. Just think about it. I, I'm sweating. So anyway, I said, Suzanne, I, I got to go. Uh, so I, I walk on out. I said, how about we go out tomorrow night? She goes, okay. So we go out the next night. Once more, we get into a makeout session. And then we decide it's probably not best to date anymore since we're going to different colleges. That's the world. Yep. That's where I lived. I don't know what part of the world you're from, but that's, that's how it was in my neck of the woods. In the church, it's not like that. We don't play games. We're not about impurity. And we're absolutely transparent about where our lives are at. There is no deceit or secret girlfriends or boyfriends. We're open. And I think in the church, we need to understand how much this means to our brothers and our sisters. And here in the church, I encourage not only the brothers to ask the sisters, but the sisters to ask the brothers. So if you're not having a date, it's really your fault. And, and, and you know, some of you marriage were all laughing. You need to repent, too, as I said. <laughs> now, I'll never forget hearing this, one, one of the sisters at a women's day. She says, every husband needs a girlfriend. Not talking about another. <laughs> but their wives need to be girlfriends. Oh. You know what I'm talking about right here, sisters? <laughs> need to be a little bit more girlfriendly wife there, okay? But brothers, we need to be courting our wives, too. Not just that they're stuck with you in marriage. <laughs> but that's one of the glories of the kingdom. One of the great glories of the kingdom are marriages that, that, are, that are awesome, that are radiant, that are fun, and that are vibrant. One of the glories of the kingdom is being able to go on Christian dates that you know are going to be fun and you know are going to be pure. And, and we, we need to really encourage each other to do that more. The other area that I feel like we have to have more accountability in is in our giving. You can see in the back of the bulletin, as we always do, we always share how much uh, the church gives each week. And the last couple of weeks, we gave a little over 8,000, a little over 9,000, but our pledges come out to a little bit over 10,000. Why? Well, it's because we're not coming through with what we pledge to God. And for those that are not members, uh, we only ask our members to give during the, um, the contribution, but... We ask each of our members to give a tithe. And many of us give more than that. And we sign a pledge card to God. But the fact of the matter is, you don't, you don't have to be a, a genius. There are a lot of people that have broken their pledges to God. And when you break your pledge to God, God will curse your life. And the principle of Achan is, not only will he curse your life, but he'll curse the congregation. So one of the things that we're working on, and uh, the regional leaders and uh, 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 Michael Kirshner and I have all been talking about 
some sort of accountability, and we want your input over the next couple of weeks about how to do it. Now, some churches have little envelopes that they give out. You have 52 envelopes for the year. Others hand out the envelopes at the door. But we want to help you be righteous. We want to help you come through with what you decided to pledge to God and not lie to God and not lie to yourself. And that way we, of course, can be able to uh, rightfully gauge what we can spend money on and what we can't. But the money is God's, and the pledge you give is to God, not to the church. It's to God. And many of us have been unfaithful. And so we need some more accountability. You know, I believe with all of my heart what David said, that God rewards us and deals with us according to our righteousness. Uh, a couple that's been so inspirational uh, for Elena and myself has been the Zindlers. And uh, their Bible talk since April has done incredible things. Uh, it's pretty cool. That since that time, uh, Roland's been baptized. Uh, Becky was baptized last Sunday. Uh, Brittany's, uh, I mean, Bridget's being baptized today. Couldn't read my handwriting right there. <laughs> and then Tina placed membership all in the last couple of months. Is that awesome? And, and they've got five guys studying the Bible and four women studying the Bible. That's awesome. Well, why is that? Well, every week since, since April, Ken's had a visitor at Bible Talk. You have a leader leading the way. You have others imitating him. And then the Lord works. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, I believe the Lord blesses us in our righteousness. I, I don't think evangelism is just a matter of, of working so hard and asking so many people. No, evangelism is walking righteously before the Lord, and the Lord brings people into your life. One of the members of the Bible Talk is uh, Caitlin Clements. And uh, she had reached out to uh, Becky about two years ago and studied the Bible with her. So Becky said, no, nope, I'm not ready, and turned aside. About three weeks ago, she says, you know something, I've got to get my life right. I'm calling Caitlin up. Out of the clear blue sky, she calls Caitlin up, starts studying the Bible, moves in with the sisters, and is baptized last Sunday. Is that awesome or not? <laughs> See, now, yes, Caitlin shared her faith two years ago. Amen? But it was the righteousness that she had, as well as the righteousness of the Bible, that began to bring her back. You know, church, we, we need to really understand the blessing of the plan of God in having small groups in the church. And when each one of our small groups is fruitful, then there's the multiplication of disciples. That's why in Acts 2, they had baptisms every day. You know, it's pretty cool. We had a baptism last Sunday, a baptism last Tuesday, five today. That's almost daily baptisms right there. And what's that from? It's because one person's working, two people, or one group? No, no. It's because we're beginning to experience multiplication in the church. But here's the bottom line. It can't be just one or two Bible talks doing it. We have all got to commit to the plan of Jesus. And the plan of Jesus is real simple when it comes right down to it. It's just simply as this. Where there is faith, there are miracles. Thank you, and God bless.